common carotid artery. Arterial supply to the head and neck arises primarily from branches originating from three sources, the subclavian artery and the external and internal carotid arteries. Common carotid artery, similar to the subclavian artery origins, differs between the left and right sides. The right common carotid artery originates from the brachiocephalic trunk, whereas the left common carotid artery originates from the arch of the aorta. The common carotid arteries possess no branches in the neck, rather, each common carotid artery bifurcates at the level of the thyroid cartilage into the internal and external carotid arteries. External carotid artery is the other terminal of the common carotid artery arising at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. The external carotid artery has six collateral and two terminal branches. The branches serve structures in the neck and the head, including the face, oral cavity, and nasal cavity. The two terminal arteries serve the oral cavity, deep face, and the structures about it, and the side of the head. External jugular vein drains the face and the neck. Veins draining the face are divided into superficial and deep veins. Small veins drain a particular area and then these veins drain into larger veins. And still larger named veins become regional veins receiving contributions from many areas. There are many direct communications between veins of areas and regions. These form venous plex uses in many regions within the head and neck as well as within the cranium. Thus, these plex uses are possible avenues for the spread of infection. Internal carotid artery possesses no branches in the neck. Instead, it enters into the cranial vault via the carotid canal to serve the structures within the cranium. Internal jugular vein drains the cranium before exiting the cranial cavity via the jugular foramen. Most of the veins draining the cranium are detailed in Chapter 17. Subclavian artery origins differ on the left and right sides of the body. The right subclavian artery is the terminal of the brachiocephalic trunk, whereas the left subclavian artery arises from the arch of the aorta. Both of the subclavian arteries ascend into the neck deep to and in a specific relationship with the anterior scalene muscle. Thus, the first part of the subclavian artery lies medial to the anterior scalene muscle, the second part of the subclavian artery lies behind the anterior scalene muscle, whereas and the third part of the artery lies lateral to the anterior scalene muscle. The several branches arising from the subclavian artery are described as arising from one of these three parts. Most of the neck structures are vascularized by branches of the subclavian arteries. Venous drainage from the head and neck is collected into two major venous trunks, the internal and external jugular veins. He head and neck receive most of their vascular supply from branches of the external and internal carotid arteries, as well as from certain branches of the subclavian artery. Most of the blood within the internal carotid artery and the vertebral branch of the subclavian artery is destined for the brain, whereas all of the blood carried by the external carotid artery and some branches of the subclavian artery supplies the remainder of the region. Drainage of this area is accomplished by the tributaries of the internal and external jugular veins, as well as those of the vertebral vein. This chapter discusses the branches and tributaries of these major vessels and their locations, sources, and destinations in a systemic fashion. However, vessels whose primary concerns are the brain and the internal base of the skull will not be detailed here, instead, that material may be found in Chapter 17. The common carotid arteries of the two sides have different origins. The right common carotid artery is a branch of the brachiocephalic trunk, whereas the left arises directly from the arch of the aorta. Consequently, the right common carotid artery is contained wholly within the neck, whereas the left common carotid artery begins in the upper thorax and enters the neck in the vicinity of the sternoclavicular joint. Once in the neck, both vessels are enclosed in their own compartment of the carotid sheath and ascend approximately to the level of the thyroid cartilage, although this is variable, where each bifurcates into an external and an internal carotid artery. Because these vessels are considered terminal branches, the common carotid artery is said to have no branches in the neck. The common carotid artery presents a slight dilation at its bifurcation, the carotid sinus, a modified region of the vessel. It is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, whose function is to monitor blood pressure. 
an additional structure, the carotid body, is also associated with the region of bifurcation. This small, oval, reddish-brown structure, lying within the wall of the carotid artery and innervate by branches of the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, is a chemoreceptor, monitoring oxygen and carbon dioxide tensions as well as hydrogen ion concentration. External carotid artery The external carotid artery has six collateral and two terminal branches. They are described in the order of their origins from inferior to superior. Superior thyroid artery The superior thyroid artery is the first branch of the external carotid artery, arising from its ventral aspect, just superior to the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. The superior thyroid artery descends in the neck, accompanied by the same named vein and the external laryngeal nerve, reaches the superior pole of the thyroid gland, and divides into its terminal branches, some of which anastomose with their counterparts of the other side and with branches of the inferior thyroid artery. The superior thyroid artery has four named branches the infrahyoid, sternocleidomastoid, superior laryngeal, and cricothyroid arteries as well as its terminal anterior, posterior, and occasionally lateral glandular branches serving the thyroid gland. The infrahyoid artery, branch, is a small vessel, passing, as its name implies, inferior to the hyoid bone to anastomose with its counterpart on the other side. Along its path, it supplies muscular branches to the infrahyoid muscles in its vicinity. The sternocleidomastoid artery, branch passes ventral to the carotid sheath, supplying the same named muscle on its deep surface and sends small twigs to structures in its vicinity. To distribute to the larynx, the superior laryngeal artery passes superficial to the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle and pierces the thyrohyoid membrane, accompanied by the internal laryngeal nerve. Within the larynx, it serves its muscles, glands, and mucosa. Carotid sinus syndrome Carotid sinus syndrome may result in loss of consciousness due to simple head movements. The syndrome relates to the hypersensitivity of the carotid sinus due to an unknown etiology. Sudden slight pressure changes, such as that occasioned by movement of the head, may result in stimulation of the carotid sinus. Impulses relayed by the sinus reduce blood pressure and slow the pumping action of the heart, thus decreasing blood supply to the brain and resulting in sudden loss of consciousness. The small cricothyroid artery courses along the cricothyroid ligament, supplying the muscle of the same name and additional structures in its vicinity. The glandular branches of the superior thyroid artery are the anterior, posterior, and, occasionally, lateral branches. The anterior branch follows the superior border of the lateral lobe, distributes to its anterior surface, and forms an anastomosis with its opposite across the isthmus. The posterior branch follows a similar course on the deep aspect of the lateral lobe, ramifies on that surface, and forms an anastomosis with the inferior thyroid artery, also supplying the parathyroid gland. Occasionally a lateral branch is present, which supplies the lateral aspect of the lateral lobe. Ascending pharyngeal artery The ascending pharyngeal artery, the smallest branch of the external carotid artery, arises on the medial aspect of that artery, shortly after the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. Along its ascent, between the pharynx and the internal carotid artery, it provides unnamed muscular branches to the prevertebral muscles, as well as branches to structures in the vicinity of its path. This artery has four named branches, pharyngeal, meningeal, inferior tympanic, and palatine. The pharyngeal branches are variable in number, 2 to 4, and supply the stylopharyngeus and middle pharyngeal constrictor muscles as well as the region of the pharyngeal mucosa in its vicinity. The meningeal arteries enter the cranial cavity via the jugular foramen posterior meningeal branch, hypoglossal canal, and foramen lacerum to serve the dura mater. The inferior tympanic artery gains access to the tympanic cavity via the petros portion of the temporal bone, to vascularize that cavity's medial wall. It is accompanied by the tympanic branch of the accessory nerve. The palatine artery courses along the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle and supplies branches to the tonsils, auditory tube, and soft palate, 
anastomosing with other arteries of this region. Lingual artery. The lingual artery often arises in common with the facial artery, then becoming the linguofacial trunk. The lingual artery originates near the posterior extent of the greater cornu of the hyoid bone, passes deep to the hypoglossal nerve, then between the middle pharyngeal constrictor and hyoglossus muscles. The artery enters the deep surface of the tongue and extends as far anteriorly as its apex. The lingual artery has four named branches, the suprahyoid, dorsal lingual, sublingual, and deep lingual arteries. The slender suprahyoid artery courses along the superior border of the hyoid bone, serving the muscles in its vicinity, and anastomosing with its counterpart on the other side. The dorsal lingual artery arises deep to the hyoglossus muscle. It ascends to the posterior dorsum of the tongue to supply the palatoglossal arch, mucous membrane of the tongue, palatine tonsil, and some of the soft palate, freely anastomosing with other arteries in its vicinity. The sublingual artery arises at the border of the hyoglossus muscle to course between the genioglossus and mylohyoid muscles on its way to the sublingual gland, which it supplies along with adjacent muscles in addition to the mucous membrane of the floor of the mouth and gingiva. Branches of this artery anastomose with the submental branch of the facial artery. The terminus of the lingual artery, known as the deep lingual artery, passes along the ventral aspect of the tongue, immediately deep to the mucous membrane, accompanied by the lingual nerve, to its apex, where it will anastomose with its counterpart of the other side. Facial artery. The facial artery arises just above, or in common with, the lingual artery and ascends, deep to the stylohyoid and posterior belly of the degastric muscles, to lie in a groove on the posterior aspect of the submandibular gland. The vessel enters the face by crossing the base of the mandible, just anterior to the masseter muscle, in the groove for the facial artery. In the face, the facial artery travels superficially, just under the cover of the platysma muscle. It passes, via a tortuous path, deep to the zygomaticus major, risorius, and levator anguli oris muscles, to the corner of the mouth. Here, it ascends lateral to the nose to terminate as the angular artery at the medial corner of the eye. The branches of the facial artery are the ascending palatine, tonsillar, glandular, and submental arteries in the neck and the inferior labial, superior labial, lateral nasal, and angular arteries in the face. The ascending palatine artery originates near the tip of the styloid process. It ascends between that process and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle, then between the stylopharyngeus and styloglossus muscles, to supply the levator veli palatini, superior pharyngeal constrictor and neighboring muscles, soft palate, tonsils, and auditory tube, finally anastomosing with other arteries in its vicinity. The tonsillar artery passes between the styloglossus and medial pterygoid muscles and pierces the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle to supply the palatine tonsil and the posterior tongue. The glandular arteries distribute as three or four vessels to the submandibular gland to supply it and the adjacent area. The submental artery arises from the facial artery near the anterior border of the masseter muscle. It follows the base of the mandible in an anterior direction and turns onto the chin at the anterior border of the depressor anguli oris muscle. The submental artery supplies the muscles it encounters along its passage and forms anastomosis with several arteries in its vicinity, including the mental and sublingual arteries. The inferior labial artery originates near the corner of the mouth, passes deep to the depressor anguli oris muscle, and pierces the orbicularis oris muscle. The artery course is superficial to that muscle, supplying it as well as the substance of the lip. It forms an anastomies with its counterpart of the other side and with branches of the mental and submental arteries. The superior labial artery arises just above and follows the same pattern as the inferior labial artery. It passes superficial to the orbicularis oris muscle in the upper lip to serve that muscle as well as the substance of the upper lip. It sends a small twig the septal branch into the nasal septum, and another one, the alar branch, into the wing of the nose. The terminus of the vessel will anastomose with its counterpart of the opposite side. The lateral nasal artery is a small branch arising at and passing into the wing and bridge of the nose, 
which it supplies. This vessel will anastomose with various other arteries in its vicinity. The angular artery is the terminal continuation of the facial artery, supplying the tissues in the vicinity of the medial corner of the eye and anastomosing with arteries of that region. Occipital artery the occipital artery originates on the posterior aspect of the external carotid artery, approximately at the same level as the origin of the facial artery. It passes superficial to the hypoglossal nerve, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the posterior belly of the degastric muscle and lodges in the groove for the occipital artery on the medial aspect of the mastoid process. It passes between the splenius capitis and semispinalis capitis muscles and pierces the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia at the region of attachment of the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles, just inferior to the superior neutral line. The artery ramifies in the superficial fascia of the scalp, serving the back of the head. The occipital artery has the following branches, sternocleidomastoid, mastoid, auricular, muscular, descending, meningeal, and occipital arteries. The sternocleidomastoid artery originates near or at the origin of the occipital artery, or occasionally directly from the external carotid artery. It courses across the hypoglossal nerve and enters the deep aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which it serves. Frequently, this artery exists as two separate upper and lower branches, where the latter accompanies the accessory nerve into the muscle. The mastoid artery is a small branch that gains access to the cranial cavity via the mastoid foramen. Along its path, it supplies the mastoid air cells, dura mater, and additional structures in its vicinity. The auricular branch passes superficial to the mastoid process to reach and supply the back of the auricle. The several unnamed muscular branches of the occipital artery distribute to the degastric, stylohyoid, longissimus, and splenius capitis muscles. The descending artery, the longest of all of the branches, originates while the occipital artery is still deep to the splenius capitis muscle. Shortly after its origin, the descending artery bifurcates into a superficial and a deep branch, serving the trapezius muscle and the deep muscles of the back of the head and neck, respectively. The superficial branch anastomoses with the transverse cervical artery, whereas the deep portion will anastomose with the vertebral and deep cervical arteries, providing a collateral circulation between the subclavian and external carotid systems of arteries. The meningeal artery branches gain access to the cranial vault via the condyloid canal and jugular foramen to vascularize the dura mater and the bones of the posterior cranial fossa. Occipital branches, which are usually two in number, medial and lateral, follow the course of the greater occipital nerve to serve the muscles and tissues of the scalp. Small branches may traverse the parietal foramen to supply the parietal meninges. Posterior auricular artery The posterior auricular artery arises from the posterior aspect of the external carotid artery near the level of the distal end of the styloid process. In passing through the substance of the parotid gland, it provides glandular and muscular branches to several muscles along its course. Its three named branches are the stylomastoid, auricular, and occipital arteries. The stylomastoid artery ascends to enter the stylomastoid foramen, accompanying the facial nerve, where it provides a twig, the posterior tympanic artery, that will follow the corda tympani nerve to vascularize the tympanic membrane. The stylomastoid artery serves the mastoid air cells, stapedius muscle, and structures in its vicinity. The auricular branch reaches the back of the auricle to supply it and its anterior aspect either by piercing the cartilage or by coursing around its free edge. The occipital artery crosses superficial to the insertion of the sternocleidomastoid muscle to supply it and the scalp in the vicinity. Its branches anastomose with branches of the superficial temporal and occipital arteries. Superficial temporal artery. The superficial temporal artery, one of the terminal branches of the external carotid artery, arises near the level of the earlobe within the substance of the parotid gland, which it supplies. The vessel branches profusely at its cranial most aspect to supply the region superficial to the zygomatic arch as far medially as the lateral corner of the eye, as well as the temple and the lateral aspect of the scalp. 
The branches of the superficial temporal artery include the transverse facial, middle temporal, zygomatico orbital, anterior auricular, frontal, and parietal arteries. The transverse facial artery arises near the level of the mandibular condyle within the substance of the parotid gland. It accompanies and supplies the parotid duct in its path across the masseter muscle. In addition, it sends branches to the parotid gland, masseter muscle, and other tissues in its vicinity. The middle temporal artery pierces the temporalis fascia near its origin to supply the temporalis muscle and anastomosis with branches of the deep temporal arteries. The zygomatico orbital artery, occasionally a branch of the middle temporal artery, follows the zygomatic arch to the lateral corner of the eye. Subsequent to supplying the orbicularis oculi muscle, it will anastomose with branches of the ophthalmic artery. The anterior auricular branches serve the anterior aspect of the ear, the ear lobe, and the proximal region of the ear canal. This vessel will anastomose with branches of the posterior auricular artery. The frontal branch follows a tortuous path deep to the integument of the forehead, where it ramifies, supplying the frontalis and orbicularis oculi muscles as well as additional tissues of the region. It will anastomose with branches of the supraorbital and supratrochlear arteries. The parietal branch passes posterior superiorly behind the auricle, supplying it and the side and back of the scalp. It will anastomose with branches of the occipital and posterior auricular arteries and its counterpart of the other side. Maxillary artery. The maxillary artery, the large terminal branch of the external carotid artery, originates deep within the body of the parotid gland. It courses anteriorly, medial to the ramus of the mandible near the level of the condylar process but superficial to the sphenomandibular ligament. Passing along the superficial or deep surface of the lateral pterygoid muscle, the maxillary artery reaches and enters the pterygopalatin fossa, where it divides into its terminal branches. The maxillary artery is described as consisting of three portions as it courses through the mandibular, pterygoid, and pterygopalatine regions. The first or mandibular portion courses deep to the mandible between the ramus and the sphenomandibular ligament. Its branches are the deep auricular, anterior tympanic, inferior alveolar, middle meningeal, and accessory menwungeal arteries. The course of the second or pterygoid portion of the maxillary artery is inconsistent because it may be either superficial or deep to the lateral pterygoid muscle, and the artery enters the pterygopalatin fossa by passing between the two heads of this muscle. Branches of the pterygoid poptitan are the deep temporal, pterygoid, masseteric, and buccal arteries. The third or pterygopalatin portion of the maxillary artery gains access to the pterygopalatin fossa via the pterygomaxillary fissure. Branches of the pterygopalatin portion are the posterior superior alveolar, occipital, greater palatine, artery of the pterygoid canal, pharyngeal, and sphenopalatine arteries. Branches of the mandibular portion. The small deep auricular artery passes medial to the temporomandibular joint, which it supplies to penetrate the wall of the external acoustic meatus, serving its lining and the tympanic membrane. The anterior tympanic artery is also small and may arise as a common trunk with the deep auricular artery. It ascends to enter the petrotympanic fissure to reach the tympanic cavity, where it serves the tympanic membrane and associated structures. The inferior alveolar artery arises from a point between the condylar process of the mandible and the sphenomandibular ligament. It passes inferiorly to enter, along the inferior alveolar nerve and vein, the mandibular foramen. Within the mandibular canal, in the vicinity of the first premolar tooth, it bifurcates to form the incisive and mental arteries. Additional branches of the inferior alveolar artery are the mylohyoid and dental arteries. The mylohyoid artery arises from its parent vessel before that artery enters the mandibular foramen. It passes along the mylohyoid groove, accompanied by the mylohyoid nerve, to serve the muscle of the same name. Dental branches enter the alveolus, periodontal ligaments, and roots of the molar and premolar teeth. The incisive branch continues anteriorly within the mandible to serve the canine, lateral, and central incisor teeth and to anastomose with its counterpart of the other side. The mental artery, accompanied by the mental nerve and veins, 
exits the mandibular canal via the mental foramen to vascularize the chin and lower lip. Its branches anastomose with those of the inferior labial and submental arteries. The accessory and middle meningeal arteries arise from the superior aspect of the maxillary artery or by a common trunk from the same artery. As the middle meningeal artery ascends to enter the foramen spinosum, it is engirdled by the two roots of the auriculotemporal nerve. The accessory meningeal artery traverses the foramen ovale. Branches of the pterygoid portion The anterior and posterior deep temporal arteries pass superiorly, deep to the temporalis muscle that they supply. They anastomose with the middle temporal and lacrimal arteries. The short pterygoid arteries arise from this portion to vascularize the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. The masseteric artery, accompanied by the same named nerve, passes through the mandibular notch to serve the masseter muscle. Some of its branches anastomose with branches of the transverse facial and facial arteries. The buccal artery accompanies the buccal nerve and passes in close association to the tendon of the temporalis muscle. It arborizes on the buccinator muscle to supply it and the mucous membrane of the mouth. Branches of the buccal artery anastomose with those of the infraorbital and facial arteries. Branches of the pterygopalatin portion. The posterior superior alveolar artery branches from the maxillary artery as that vessel enters the pterygomaxillary fissure. It travels along the maxillary tuberosity and enters the posterior superior alveolar foramen in conjunction with the like named nerve. The vessel ramifies within the maxilla to serve the maxillary sinus, molar, and premolar teeth, and neighboring gingiva. The infraorbital artery appears as the continuation of the maxillary artery, however, it may originate in common with the posterior superior alveolar A artery. It enters the floor of the orbit through the inferior orbital fissure, lies in the infraorbital groove, then leaves the orbit via the infraorbital canal to enter the face by way of the infraorbital foramen. Branches of the infraorbital artery are the orbital branches, serving the inferior oblique and inferior rectus muscles, as well as the lacrimal gland. The anterior superior alveolar branches vascularize the maxillary sinus, maxillary canine, and incisor teeth as well as their respective gingiva. The facial branches enter the face via the infraorbital foramen deep to the levator labii superioris muscle, where they provide labial, nasal, and palpebral branches to serve the lacrimal sac, nose, and upper lip. The various branches anastomose with branches of the angular, dorsal nasal, buccal, transverse facial, and facial arteries. The descending palatine artery descends in the pterygopalatin canal then gives rise to the greater palatine artery and its branch, the lesser palatine artery, which gain entrance to the palate via the greater palatine and lesser palatine foramina, respectively. The greater palatine artery courses in an anterior direction on the lateral aspect of the hard palate to supply the palatal mucosa, gingiva, and glands and then proceeds to anastomose with the nasopalatine artery in the incisive canal. The lesser palatine artery vascularizes the soft palate and tonsil. It will anastomose with the ascending palatine branch of the facial artery as well as the tonsillar branches of the facial, lingual, and ascending pharyngeal arteries. The small artery of the pterygoid canal passes through the posterior wall of the pterygopalatin fossa by way of the pterygoid canal to supply part of the auditory tube, pharynx, middle ear, and sphenoidal sinus. The small pharyngeal branch passes dorsally, through the pharyngeal canal, to vascularize the auditory tube, sphenoidal sinus, and portions of the pharynx. The sphenopalatine artery leaves the pterygopalatin fossa via the sphenopalatine foramen on its medial wall to enter the nasal fossa, where it vascularizes portions of the nasal conchi and meat uses by its posterior lateral nasal branches as well as the posterior segment of the median nasal septum by its posterior septal branches. The longest branch of this vessel is the nasopalatine artery, which descends along the vomer bone to enter the incisive canal. It is here that it will anastomose with branches of the greater palatine artery. Internal carotid artery The internal carotid artery has no branches in the neck. It ascends deep to the parotid gland, degastric muscle, and muscles attached to the styloid process in its own compartment of the carotid sheath.
the internal carotid artery gains access to the cranial cavity via the carotid canal of the petros temporal bone to vascularize regions of the brain, orbit, portions of the nasal cavity, and for it. Associated with the artery is the carotid plexus of nerves, composed of postganglionic sympathetic nerve fibers derived from the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. The internal carotid artery is described as having four portions, cervical, petros, cavernous, and cerebral, referring to its termination in the vicinity of the lateral cerebral fissure. The cervical portion of the artery has no branches. The petros portion, located entirely within the carotid canal of the petros temporal bone, has four branches, the carotocotympanic, artery of the pterygoid canal, cavernous, and hypophyseal arteries. The cavernous portion, located within the cavernous sinus, but isolated from the cavernous blood by the endothelially lined fibrous sheaths, gives rise to the ganglionic, anterior meningeal, ophthalmic, and anterior and middle cerebral arteries. The cerebral portion gives rise to the ophthalmic and anterior and middle cerebral arteries. Its terminal branches are the posterior communicating and anterior choroidal arteries. Petros portion Because the arteries of the petros portion are small, they will be treated as a single unit. The carotocotympanic branch leaves the carotid canal to gain access to the tympanic cavity, part of which it vascularizes. The artery of the pterygoid canal is not always present, when it is, it will anastomose with the same named branch of the maxillary artery within the pterygoid canal. The several cavernous and hypophyseal branches supply the trigeminal ganglion, pituitary gland, and dura mater in their vicinity. Cavernous portion The small ganglionic and anterior meningeal branches supply the trigeminal ganglion and the dura mater of the anterior cranial fossa, respectively. Cerebral portion Ophthalmic artery The ophthalmic artery originates a few millimeters dorsal to the optic foramen, canal, through which it gains access to the orbit accompanied by the optic nerve, which is superior and medial to it. Within the orbit, the artery crosses superior to the nerve, but inferior to the superior rectus muscle, to reach the medial wall of the orbit. The ophthalmic artery serves the orbit as well as the eyeball, and its muscles and its branches are described accordingly. The orbital group consists of the lacrimal, supraorbital, posterior and anterior ethmoidal, medial palpebral, supratrochlear, and dorsal nasal arteries. The ocular group is composed of the central artery of the retina, short and long posterior ciliary, anterior ciliary, and muscular arteries. The lacrimal artery arises on the lateral aspect of the ophthalmic artery and passes, accompanied by the lacrimal nerve, to the lacrimal gland, which it supplies. The lateral palpebral branches of the lacrimal artery serve the upper and lower eyelids. Additional named branches include the zygomatic and recurrent branches. The former, passing through the zygomatico-temporal and zygomatico-facial foramina, serves the contents of the temporal fossa and the substance of the cheek, whereas the latter supplies the dura mater, reaching it via the superior orbital fissure. The supraorbital artery courses forward in the orbit on the medial margin of the superior rectus muscle and then travels with the frontal nerve, superficial to the levator palpebri superioris muscle, serving both muscles, to reach and enter the supraorbital foramen. The artery distributes on the forehead and will anastomose with branches of the superficial temporal and supratrochlear arteries, as well as with its counterpart of the other side. The small posterior ethmoidal artery leaves the orbit via the same named foramen, accompanying the same named nerve, supplies the posterior ethmoidal air cells, the dura mater of the cribriform plate, and regions of the nasal cavity. The anterior ethmoidal artery is larger than the previous vessel. It leaves the orbit by way of the anterior ethmoidal foramen, accompanying the same named nerve. It vascularizes the frontal sinus, all of the ethmoidal air cells, except for the posterior, and a region of the dura mater of the anterior cranial fossa. Its large nasal branch enters the nasal cavity along a hiatus by the cristagalli to serve the walls of the nasal cavity. A cutaneous twig of the nasal branch serves the bridge of the nose. 
the superior and inferior medial palpebral arteries each form an arch in the upper and lower eyelids, respectively. The inferior palpebral artery also sends a twig to the nasolacrimal sac and duct. These vessels form extensive anastomoses with other arteries of the region and with each other. The supratrochlear artery, a terminal branch of the ophthalmic artery, leaves the orbit medial to the supraorbital foramen. It serves the forehead and will anastomose with the supraorbital artery and its counterpart of the other side. The dorsal nasal artery, the inferiorly positioned terminal branch of the ophthalmic artery, leaves the orbit at its medial angle to serve the bridge and side of the nose. Its lacrimal branch supplies the nasolacrimal SAE and duct. The small central artery of the retina passes within the optic nerve to supply it as well as the retina of the bulb. The several short posterior ciliary arteries pass to the eyeball around the periphery of the optic nerve. They pierce the sclera to serve it and the ciliary processes. The two long posterior ciliary arteries pass lateral and medial to the optic nerve to supply the ciliary muscle and iris, subsequent to piercing the sclera. The anterior ciliary arteries pass deep to the conjunctiva and penetrate the sclera just posterior to the corneoscleral junction to serve the ciliary muscles. The superior and inferior muscular branches serve all of the extrinsic muscles of the eyeball, as well as the levator palpebrae superioris. The anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, posterior communicating, and anterior choroidal arteries are discussed in Chapter 17. The subclavian artery, is a short vessel extending as far laterally as the outer border of the first rib. The origins of the right and left subclavian arteries differ in that the left one arises directly from the arch of the aorta, whereas the right is one of the terminal branches of the brachiocephalic trunk. The right subclavian artery originates deep to the sternoclavicular joint, and the left originates behind the common carotid artery around the third or fourth thoracic vertebra. Both right and left subclavian arteries travel superiorly to the root of the neck and posterior to the anterior scalene muscle, emerging into the posterior triangle through the interval between the anterior and middle scalene muscles on their way to the lateral border of the first rib, where each artery becomes known as the axillary artery. This passage, deep to the anterior scalene muscle, permits a convenient division of the subclavian artery into three parts. The first part is from the origin of the vessel to the medial border of the anterior scalene muscle, the second part lies deep to this muscle, and the third part extends from the lateral border of the anterior scalene to the lateral border of the first rib. The branches of the subclavian artery are the vertebral artery, internal thoracic artery, and thyrocervical trunk from the first part, the costocervical trunk from the second part, and the dorsal scapular artery from the third part. First part of the subclavian artery. Vertebral artery. The vertebral artery takes its origin from the postero superior aspect of the first part of the subclavian artery. It ascends behind the anterior scalene muscle, along the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra, and enters the foramen transversarium of the sixth cervical vertebra. The artery travels through the foramina transversaria of the upper six cervical vertebrae and enters the suboccipital triangle from where it traverses the foramen magnum. Branches of the vertebral artery are described according to the region occupied by the vessel, namely, cervical and cranial branches. The cervical branches are the spinal and muscular arteries, whereas the cranial branches are five in number, the meningeal, posterior spinal, anterior spinal, postero-inferior cerebellar, and medullary arteries. The numerous spinal arteries gain access to the vertebral canal via the intervertebral foramina to serve the spinal meninges, spinal cord, and bony vertebral column. The unnamed muscular branches provide numerous twigs to supply the deep muscles of the neck. Branches of these vessels anastomose with other vessels in their vicinity. Internal thoracic artery The internal thoracic artery originates from the inferior aspect of the first part of the subclavian artery. This artery passes directly inferiorly on the internal anterior thoracic wall just lateral to the margin of the sternum to the sixth or seventh rib, where it bifurcates to form the medially placed superior epigastric and laterally positioned musculophrenic arteries. Because the internal thoracic artery is a vessel whose distribution is limited to the thorax and abdomen, 
its branches will not be discussed. Thyrocervical trunk. The thyrocervical trunk is a short vessel arising from the superior aspect of the first part of the subclavian artery. This trunk lies just medial to the anterior scalene muscle, where it trifurcates to form three major branches, the suprascapular, transverse cervical, and inferior thyroid arteries. The suprascapular artery travels obliquely across the anterior surface of the anterior scalene muscle and deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscles, which it supplies. It passes deep to the inferior belly of the omohyoid muscle to reach the scapular notch. Occasionally, the suprascapular artery is a branch of the third part of the subclavian artery. The transverse cervical artery crosses the neck in a fashion similar to but above the suprascapular artery. It crosses the floor of the subclavian triangle, accompanied by the spinal accessory nerve, to burrow under the anterior border of the trapezius muscle, supplying it and other muscles in the vicinity. The inferior thyroid artery travels superiorly in front of the medial border of the anterior scalene muscle. It then passes deep to the carotid sheath and approaches the inferior aspect of the thyroid gland, which it supplies. The inferior thyroid artery has several small branches, including the ascending and descending branches ending in the body of the thyroid gland, as well as muscular branches and the ascending cervical artery supplying anterior vertebral muscles of the neck. In addition, branches are also distributed to the larynx, the inferior laryngeal artery, trachea, tracheal artery, and esophagus. Second part of the subclavian artery, costa cervical trunk. The costa cervical trunk has different origins on the two sides of the body. On the left, it springs from the posterior aspect of the first part of the subclavian artery, whereas on the right it springs from the posterior aspect of the second part of that artery. This trunk has two terminal branches, the superior intercostal and deep cervical arteries. The superior intercostal artery serves the first and second intercostal spaces. The deep cervical artery is interposed between the first rib and the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra. It passes between the semispinalis cervices and semispinalis capitis muscles, supplying these as well as adjacent muscles, finally anastomosing with the occipital and vertebral arteries. Third part of the subclavian artery. Dorsal scapular artery. The dorsal scapular artery is the only branch arising from the third part of the subclavian artery, although frequently it is a branch of the second part. The dorsal scapular artery passes among the trunks of the brachial plexus, anterior to the middle scalene muscle, to reach the superior angle of the scapula, where it supplies muscles in the vicinity. The veins serving the region of the head and neck are subdivided, for descriptive purposes, into three major groups, the veins of the face, cranium, and neck. Most of the veins of the cranium are detailed in Chapter 17 and will not be discussed at this point. Veins of the face. The veins of the face are subdivided into two categories, namely, superficial and deep veins. The named superficial veins are the facial, superficial temporal, posterior auricular, occipital, and retromandibular veins, and the named deep veins are the maxillary and pterygoid plexus of veins. Facial vein. The facial vein serves as the principal venous vessel of the superficial face. It begins in the medial corner of the eye as the angular vein, by the confluence of the supratrochlear and supraorbital veins, and passes inferiorly, following the course of the facial artery deep to the zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor muscles, where it parts company with the artery to empty into the internal jugular vein. The facial vein communicates with the pterygoid plexus of veins and with the ophthalmic veins, both of which present possible passageways to the cavernous sinus due to lack of directional valves. Tributaries of the facial vein include the deep facial vein, which connects it to the pterygoid plexus of veins, the frontal vein, which drains a region of the forehead, and the supraorbital and supratrochlear veins. In addition, the superior palpebral, external nasal, masseteric, anterior parotid, superior and inferior labial, and submental veins also join the facial vein. Superficial temporal vein. The superficial temporal vein follows the course of the same named artery to drain the scalp, temple, and part of the forehead and ear.
This vessel begins as a plexus of small veins on the side and top of the head. Among the tributaries of the superficial temporal vein are the transverse facial vein, middle temporal vein, and anterior auricular veins. Posterior auricular vein The posterior auricular vein, one of the two veins participating in the formation of the external jugular vein, begins as a plexus of small veins behind the ear and courses in an antero-inferior direction, passing superficial to mastoid attachment of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Its tributaries include the stylomastoid vein. Occipital vein The occipital vein enters the suboccipital triangle to join a plexus of veins drained by the vertebral vein. Tributaries of the occipital vein include the mastoid, emissary vein. Occasionally, the occipital vein joins either the internal jugular or the posterior auricular veins. Retromandibular vein The retromandibular vein, one of the two veins participating in formation of the external jugular vein, is frequently formed within the substance of the parotid gland. It is formed when the maxillary vein joins the superficial temporal vein. Tributaries of this short vessel include the common facial, middle temporal, and anterior auricular veins. Maxillary vein The relatively short maxillary vein follows the mandibular portion of the same named artery deep to the mandibular ramus to participate in conjunction with the superficial temporal vein, in the formation of the retromandibular vein. The maxillary vein arises from the pterygoid plexus of veins. Pterygoid plexus of veins the pterygoid plexus of veins is a massive network of venous channels lying on or about the surfaces of the lateral and medial pterygoid muscles and extending into the spaces of the deep face within the infratemporal fossa. This plexus is in direct or indirect communication with a vast area, including the cranial cavity and cavernous sinus, the nasal cavity, orbit, paranasal sinuses, and superficial face. Some of its tributaries include the middle meningeal veins, posterior superior and inferior alveolar veins, veins that serve the muscles of mastication, as well as the infraorbital vein, buccal veins, and sphenopalatine vein. In addition, it receives emissary veins and a communication from the inferior ophthalmic vein. Moreover, numerous smaller named and unnamed veins join the pterygoid plexus of veins. Veins of the cranium Although most of the veins of the cranium were detailed in Chapter 17, the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins of the orbit will be treated in this section. Superior Ophthalmic Vein The superior ophthalmic vein is formed by the nasofrontal vein, which communicates with the angular, derived from the supraorbital and supratrochlear, veins. It enters the cranial cavity via the superior orbital fissure and empties its contents into the cavernous sinus. Its tributaries include the posterior and anterior ethmoidal, lacrimal, ciliary, and a branch of the inferior ophthalmic veins. In addition, numerous smaller named and unnamed veins join the superior ophthalmic vein. Inferior ophthalmic vein The inferior ophthalmic vein is formed by the confluence of several small veins in the anterior floor of the orbit, among which are unnamed inferior muscular branches and the anterior ciliary vein. The inferior ophthalmic vein bifurcates into a superior portion that usually joins the superior ophthalmic vein, or drains directly into the cavernous sinus, and an inferior portion that becomes a tributary of the pterygoid plexus of veins, which it reaches by way of the inferior orbital fissure. Veins of the neck The veins of the neck include the external jugular, internal jugular, vertebral, and subclavian veins the spread of a possibly fatal infection to the cavernous sinus. External jugular vein The external jugular vein is formed by the union of the posterior auricular and retromandibular veins just posterior to the angle of the mandible, sometimes within the body of the parotid gland. It passes straight down the neck, under the cover of the platysma muscle and associated superficial fascia, superficial to the fleshy belly of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Along its path it crosses this muscle at an oblique angle. Once it reaches the subclavian triangle, the external jugular vein pierces the investing fascia, parallels the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and dives deep to the clavicle to deliver its blood into the subclavian vein, which it joins.
the external jugular vein has two pairs of incompetent valves just before it empties into the subclavian vein. Several tributaries join the external jugular vein, namely, the posterior external jugular vein, which drains the superficial aspect of the back of the neck, and two others, the transverse cervical and suprascapular veins. The last two veins drain the region of the shoulder. Another superficial vessel, the anterior jugular vein, occasionally empties into the external jugular vein, but usually it joins the subclavian vein directly. The anterior jugular vein is variable, but normally it begins at the level of the body of the hyoid bone and descends parallel to the anterior midline of the neck. Inferiorly, near the origin of the medial head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the anterior jugular vein pierces the superficial lamina of the investing layer and turns laterally, pierces the posterior lamina, and joins the subclavian, or occasionally, the external jugular, vein. While it is between the two laminae of the investing fascia, the anterior jugular vein communicates with its corresponding vein of the other side via a venous connection, the jugular arch, which occupies the suprasternal space. The external jugular, posterior external jugular, and anterior external jugular veins have numerous smaller named and unnamed tributaries, which drain the areas in their immediate vicinity. Internal jugular vein the internal jugular vein is the principal vessel responsible for collecting blood from the brain, superficial aspects of the face, and neck. The vessel extends from its dilated origin, the superior jugular bulb housed in the jugular foramen, to its inferior dilation, the inferior jugular bulb terminating in the brachiocephalic vein. The internal jugular vein is enclosed in the carotid sheath as it travels the length of the neck, and its tributaries pierce this fascia to deliver their blood to the vessel. The internal jugular vein receives blood from the following tributaries, dural venous sinus drainage from with the cranium, the facial vein from the superficial face, the lingual vein from the tongue and floor of the mouth, and pharyngeal, superior, and middle thyroid, and, occasionally the occipital veins from the neck. The dural venous sinuses and their drainage into the superior bulb of the internal jugular vein are described in chapter 17. The facial and occipital veins are detailed in this chapter under the heading veins of the face, therefore, only the lingual, pharyngeal, and superior and middle thyroid veins are discussed here. The lingual vein receives several tributaries that drain the tongue and floor of the mouth the sublingual, dorsal lingual, and deep lingual veins, which follow the paths of their corresponding arteries. The small pharyngeal veins communicate with the pharyngeal plexus of veins and sometimes deliver their blood to the superior thyroid, lingual, or facial veins instead of to the internal jugular vein. The superior and middle thyroid veins both drain the thyroid gland and join the internal jugular vein at its superior and inferior aspects, respectively. Both vessels receive smaller named and unnamed tributaries. The inferior thyroid vein usually delivers its blood into the brachiocephalic trunk. Vertebral veins Unlike their arterial counterpart, the vertebral veins do not traverse the foramen magnum, instead, they are formed from the confluence of many small tributaries within the suboccipital triangle. The vertebral veins enter the foramen transversarium of the axis and form a plexus of veins surrounding the vertebral artery, and descend with it within the foramina transversaria of the remaining cervical vertebrae except the last. They end in the brachiocephalic vein or occasionally in the subclavian vein. Tributaries of the vertebral veins include the anterior and accessory vertebral veins and the deep cervical vein. Subclavian vein The subclavian vein is short because it is the continuation of the axillary vein, and it joins the internal jugular vein to form the large brachiocephalic vein. Thus, the subclavian vein extends from the external border of the first rib to the junction with the internal jugular vein, passing anterior to the anterior scalene muscle, which separates it from the subclavian artery. Here it lies in front of the subclavius muscle, which acts as a cushion, protecting the underlying vessels and nerves. The main tributary of the subclavian vein is the external jugular vein, although frequently the subclavian may receive the dorsal scapular and anterior jugular veins. The left subclavian vein receives lymph from most of the body via the thoracic duct, 
whereas lymph from the right upper quadrant of the body is delivered to the right subclavian vein by the right lymphatic duct. These ducts pierce the superior aspects of the subclavian veins, just before these are joined by the internal jugular veins. Venous Manometer The external jugular vein may be used as a venous manometer because in a supine patient the venous blood pressure is not high enough to engorge this vessel much above the clavicle. During failure of the right side of the heart, constriction of the superior vena cava and increased pressure in the thorax induces a pressure buildup in the venous side of the circulatory system, and this is evidenced by engorgement of the external jugular vein. Under severe conditions, the vessel may be filled as high as the base of the mandible. This extremely important sign should be recognized by dental professionals using real and ink chairs in their practice, the patient should be referred immediately for possible cardiac care. Improper administration of anesthesia, improper administration of anesthesia for a maxillary molar tooth may cause the needle to puncture the pterygoid venous plexus, resulting in a hematoma with noticeable swelling. The needle tract may permit the spread of a possibly fatal infection to the cavernous sinus. Thrombophlebitis of the facial vein. The facial vein does not contain valves, thus, blood flow may pass in either direction and into other venous vessels that may be connected to the cavernous sinus located in the dural venous sinus deep within the cranium. These connections include the superior ophthalmic vein, pterygoid venous plexus, inferior ophthalmic vein, and slash or the deep facial vein. Infections in the face, especially in the triangular danger zone of the face bordered by the upper lip, lateral aspect of the nose, and lateral corners of the eyes above the supraorbital ridge, may cause inflammation of the facial vein and development of thrombophlebitis, clot formation, of the facial vein. Pieces of the infected clot may become free to eventually pass into the cavernous sinus, giving rise to thrombophlebitis of the cavernous sinus a life-threatening situation if left untreated. Blockage Central Artery of the Retina Because branches of the central artery of the retina are very small, obstructions such as small emboli may cause instant and total blindness. This condition is usually unilateral and occurs mostly in older individuals. Nose Bleeding Epistaxis Bleeding from the nose subsequent to injury of the nose is a common occurrence and is usually relatively easy to control. Normally, the source of blood flow is the Kieselbach area. The mucosa of the antero-inferior region of the nasal septum, where the septal branch of the superior labial, anterior ethmoidal, nasopalatine, and greater palatine arteries anastomose. The bleeding is controlled by pressure or by packing the nose with cotton. Occasionally bleeding is from higher up in the nose, where control may require more heroic action. When the injury is from a direct blow, the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone may be fractured.